we're good? Okay. Okay, everybody. Welcome back. It's Tisha B'Av today. Saddest day of the month of, saddest day of the year for the Jewish people. Um, in many respects, it's just a, like a jinx day today. I just read that a um, prominent member of the uh, London Chabad community, Rabbi Potash, passed away today. Uh, many things happen, things that are not so good happen, so just be careful, uh, stay inside and watch all the various Zooms that are being shown and uh, that's probably the best thing today. Um, as far as halachas, we're going to put on tefillin later on today, our talis of tefillin later on today. We're going to add some of the prayers that we missed at Shacharis, Shir Shalyom, the uh, uh, the Song of the Day and Enka Um as well. That will be done later on at Mincha. Here in San Diego, Mincha will be at our synagogue at 720. And uh, it's a special Mincha as well. Anyhow, let's talk about a sikha that the Rebbe gave in 1980 on Erev Menachem Av, Erev Rosh Chodesh. Menachem Av, this is the month of Av, as we'll see in a minute. And um, we'll, just, uh, we'll see what he says about that. So he says that the ninth of Av is observed as a public fast day for five tragedies that took place uh, then, at this time. What were the five tragedies? First, it was decreed in the desert when the spies came back from spying out the land of Israel. They cried that they'll never be able to uh, conquer the land of Israel. They cried and cried, and of course Moshe said that they have no reason to cry, but since you're crying for no reason, I'll give you a reason. And that day should be a day of crying for all time. And that day, our sages tell us, was Tisha B'Av. So it was on that day, it was decreed that the Jews in the desert will not enter the land of Israel, and um, they will die out in the desert. Secondly, the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. The, thirdly, the second temple was destroyed by the Romans. Um, the first temple was destroyed because of Abodazara, idol worship. And uh, what the prophet spoke about also was the lack of morality among the Jewish people. That they didn't care for the widows and the orphans. They didn't care for each other. And so much of what the prophets talk about who lived during that time was the lack of morality, the lack of ethics by the Jewish people. That was the cause of the first temple's destruction. The second temple's destruction was because of sinas chinam, hatred of each other. During the times of the second temple, especially towards the end, there was a great deal of, of uh, separation, divisions among the Jewish people. You had the tzadukim, the uh, Sadducees, who did not accept the oral Torah, and you had the Essenes, who were a very cynical group, a negative group. Some people believe that the Jews who died in Masada, who, who committed suicide on Masada, were of the Essene group, um, something that uh, it's questionable whether they actually did the right thing or not. But uh, nevertheless, they were a, a group of people who were very negative and very cynical. And the third group were the Purushim, the Pharisees, Pharisees which were the rabbinical class, which are the, uh, the Jewish people today, are the descendants of the Purushim. So there were Jews who were separated and divided, and in many cases, in some cases, they even waged war on each other. So uh, there was a great deal of division and strife. It wasn't just a question of saying, saying gossip. It was much worse than that. It was very bad. And hopefully it shouldn't get like that today with all the various divisions of the Jewish people also, hopefully. Fourthly, the great metropolis of Betar was devastated and hundreds of thousands of residents were killed by the Romans at Betar. Betar was one of the great Torah academies of all time. Um, finally, the, uh, the base of Migdash and its surroundings were plowed under by Turnfus Rufus. And uh, this was a sign that uh, the destruction was absolutely complete. The destruction of the Second Temple, the Rebbe says, was the beginning of the exile of which we are now suffering. We are now in the current exile. We know the first exile was in Egypt. The second exile was the Babylonian exile. 
which was a 70 year exile. We are in the third exile, the Roman exile. Uh, Gullus, Ro Gullus Edom, or Gullus Rome, in which we are suffering to this day. Its cause is the wrongdoing of the Jewish people, as we say, through, through Sinos Kingdom. Um, as it says, because of our sins, we were exiled, because of our sins, we were exiled from our land. And how do we correct that? How do we bring Mashiach through Teshuva and Masin through, through through repentance? And through good deeds, we eliminate the cause of the Golas, and hopefully by doing that, the exile will come to an end. I heard an interesting thing by a friend of mine, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Kaplan uh, from, uh, from Israel, who said, who said that, you know, why is it that Chabad is not so much involved with all these, these uh, Lushan horror campaigns? You know, every year, uh, so many of the synagogues, they have these campaigns to stamp out Lush and Hara. And they have stickers that you put on your, on your um, phone, and they have speakers. Lush and Hara means gossip, slander against other people. Chabad, even though certainly we also believe that you shouldn't tell Lush and Hara, and we talk a lot about it, but we're not really into these campaigns. So my friend, my friend Rabbi Kaplan said, that the reason is not so much that we are uh, against Lashon Hara so much, but what is the cause of Lashon Hara? The cause of Lashon Hara is hatred of our fellow. If we loved our fellow, we truly would not to say Lashon Hara. So in order to stamp out Lashon Hara, we need to increase our Avas Yisrael, our love of our fellow Jew. That's really what we need to do. And therefore, love of your fellow Jew must be our top priority. In fact, the Rebbe made that one of the principles of his 10-point mitzvah campaign, the mitzvah of Abbas Yisrael. So any other, Rebbe talks about the idea of Golas, exile. He says, exile is not just a punishment for transgressions. It serves as a means to a goal, which could not be reached without the underlying terrible tragedy and trial of exile. In other words, the purpose, exile has a purpose to it. It has a purpose to it. And what is the purpose of it? So the Alter Rebbe says, he uses the expression, a Yerida Litzorech Aliyah, a descent for the purpose of a higher ascent. Now this concept of Yerida Litzorech Aliyah is found many places in Hasidic philosophy. It is talked about as far as the descent of the soul into the body. Why does the soul, which is so lofty, wish to come into a physical low body where it be limited to uh, eating and sleeping and disease and all kinds of physical ailments and problems that it has. So we're told there, there's a famous expression, a song actually, that Hasidim sing, uh, which goes like follows. It says, Haneshama Yerida Letol Chaguf. The soul wishes to descend into a body. Ach, so eket, die, die. So it cries out, enough, enough. Why do I want to be in such a situation? Here I have it in heaven. I'm so happy over here. I'm with Hashem. I'm with all the tzaddikim that lived before me. I'm learning Torah day and night. I have such a wonderful life. I have no physical problem. Why in the world? when I want to come into a low physical body, into a low physical world? So he answers, Hayerida litzarech aliyah. So the, the descent is for the purpose of a higher ascent, so that I should go even higher. The soul is told, you're right, you're going to go into a low world, but ultimately you're going to come out of it even better than you were before. So then the, the Shaman says, uh, so this is al kedai. It's appropriate that I'll do it. And the Shaman Yerida L'Tzorech Aguf, Ach Tzorech Es Dai Dai, A Yerida Hu L'Tzorech Aliyah, Ach Kedai. So it's kedai. It's appropriate. It's good. And the soul agrees to do that. The soul agrees to do that. And we are told that every exile is a descent for the purpose of a higher ascent. A higher ascent. So what does this mean? 
The descent of the Jewish people into exile is for the purpose of reaching spiritual heights that ordinarily would have been inaccessible if it wasn't for that ascent. That is not to say that we are looking forward to exile, that we want suffering. God forbid. I mean, the uh, Holocaust was one of the was the most horrible experience that Jewish people ever went through in our entire history. But at the end of the Holocaust came the state of Israel. And would the state of Israel have happened if not for the Holocaust? I don't know. Possibly, yeah. Possibly not. Is that to say that we look for look? We wanted a Holocaust. God forbid. Of course not. But the descent of a Holocaust, the tremendous low period of suffering, the horrible experience that we experienced through the Holocaust, possibly was responsible for the coming of the state of Israel. And every every exile we have gone through has been like that. And if Jews were given a choice, if Jews would have been said, listen, I will spare you the Holocaust, but you won't have a state of Israel, we would have said, gladly, gladly. We don't want to suffer. We don't want its sufferings, and we don't want its rewards, in the words of the Gemara. We don't want it. We get put away the suffering, get rid of the suffering when we are in pain. We don't want the pain. You'll say, yes. But if you have the pain, you will have a better outcome afterwards. You'll have a better understanding of life and, and all kinds of... No, no, I don't want it. I don't want the pain. Take the pain away. But God does not give us that choice. He does not give us that choice. So we uh, are left with our situation, and we deal with our situation, and that's the way it is. But as it happens all too often... At the end of Gullus, at the end of exile, comes a um, comes a, a, a Yeshua. Comes something very good. When Jews derive, despite the awesome tribulations and hardships of the exile, stand steadfast in their faith and exhibit a degree of self-sacrifice unknown to previous generations, they reach an inconceivably lofty level. The Jews, after we have gone through pain and suffering and difficult times, we are at an infinitely higher level than we were before it. It's not to say we want the pain, but the result is afterwards we are, we are a changed people. A person who has gone through, God forbid, a terrible illness, horrible illness, they've gone through treatments and, can't, and they've gone through chemotherapy and radiation and pain and lost their hair and all kinds of things. But at the end, they have come out of it with a greater understanding of life, with a greater appreciation of life, and the urgency of accomplishing things that previously they were not accomplishing. This itself is a tremendous accomplishment. Again, that is not to say we want the pain, but nevertheless, the rewards that come afterwards are in many cases tremendous rewards. And people who have gone through the pain tell us that they are a different person now than they were before. So the, the, goal, the goal of exile, the Rebbe says, parallels the redemption from the first exile undergone by the Jewish people, the redemption from Egyptian slavery. So God decreed that the Jews should be enslaved by the Egyptians and afflicted for, for 400 years. It was a terrible, terrible uh, exile. It was a terrible enslavement. Many, many, many Jews died and were tortured by it. And just the experience of slavery, there's nothing like that. But afterwards, it says, you'll go out, the Torah tells us, Berachush Gadol, with great wealth. And the, indeed, the Jews came out of Egypt with all the gold in the world. They were a very wealthy, a very powerful nation after they left Egypt. Um, the Jews were already spiritually wealthy before the Egyptian exile, and they would certainly have been willing to forgo this anticipated greater wealth that was destined for them to have later if they would not have to go through the terrible exile in Egypt. Uh, but God decreed otherwise. God decreed that it's meant to be, and it was not really up to us ultimately for this to happen. The purpose of their descent into bondage was that they should be therefore garnish great wealth 
at the end, or, at the end greater than before the descent, so it was worth the delay. And our present exile has the same purpose in the succinct words of the Yalkut Shimoni, one of the Midrashim, the Yalkut on Yirmiyahu. So on, on, um, I'd like to discuss this a little, but the Rebbe brings out the Yalkut Shimoni on Yirmiyahu. Yirmiyahu, the prophet Jeremiah, wrote several books. Of course, we know the famous is the, uh, the, um, the book of Yirmiyahu, of Jeremiah. Uh, but today, we read the book of Echa, the book of Lamentations. We read it last night. Many people have a custom to read it again during the daytime. Yirmiyahu wrote the book of, of Echa. And in, the, in Echa, we find that Echa talks about the descent of the Jewish people into exile and the terrible destruction that took place as a result of that. Of the two prophets, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, and Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, is called the prophet of consolation. This coming Shabbos, the Shabbos after Tisha B'Av, we read the, the Haftorah, Nachmu, Nachmu, Ami, which recounts the words of Yeshayahu, who says, comfort, comfort is my, my people. I will comfort, I will surely comfort my people, God says. Yirmiyahu is a, uh, Yeshayahu rather, Isaiah, is a prophet of consolation. Comforting the Jewish people after the terrible destruction of the, of the loss of the temple. Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, on the other hand, is called the prophet of doom, of destruction, because Jeremiah prophesied the destruction of the temple. And in fact, during the destruction, Jeremiah ran away, fled. It was so horrible that he fled to Egypt, where ultimately he died. So Jeremiah was a very, very negative uh, prophet, a prophet of doom and gloom, as they say. And because of that, because Jeremiah prophesied the doom and gloom of the Jewish people, the ultimate destruction of the temple, the Rebbe points out this was a descent, a Yerida like no other. Therefore, it, it heralds a greater ascent afterward. That through the words of Jeremiah, in Echa and in the book of Jeremiah, we see the redemption of the Jewish people in an even greater way because of their destruction, because of all the horrible things that they went through. Therefore, Jeremiah is seen as the, as the uh, prophet, really, of, of the, of the, um, of the um, redemption to come. He says, the Rebbe says, our present exile has the same purpose as the Alkut Shimoni says in Yermiyahu, he says, quote, using his words, the lion rose, meaning Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who destroyed the temple. He's called the lion. In the mazel of Ari, which is the astrological sign of the lion, which is the fifth month of Av, we know that uh, in Jewish astrology, as in regular astrology, each Hebrew month has a particular sign to it, and in, um, in um, non-Jewish astrology, you find uh, uh, one sign can be a part of this month, another part of that, part of January, part of February. In Jewish astrology, in traditional Jewish astrology, each of the Hebrew months has its own sign. And the sign for the month of Av, which we're in now, is the sign of the Ari. The Ari represents kingship and hope for the future. The uh, Yalkut Shemoni continues. He says, the lion rose in the mazel of Ari. He continues, and destroyed Ariel. Ariel refers to Yerushalayim, he says, Jerusalem. So that the lion, namely God, the Holy One, should come during the mazel of Ari, during this month, where we're told Mashiach is supposed to be born during the month of Ari, of the lion, of Av, 
and reconstruct Ariel, reconstruct Jerusalem. These are the words that the Rebbe brings out from the Alpi Shimoni. So this is a prophecy that that um, the Alka brings that the, the destruction should take place on this month, but also the redemption and the rebuilding ultimately of Yerushalayim should also take place during this month. Interestingly, there is a settlement in the, the West Bank in Israel called Ariel. Um, I once met the mayor of Ariel, Dan Nachman, all the Shalom. And uh, it was called Ariel, but Ariel actually in Torah refers to Yerushalayim in many places. Anyhow, the Alka Shimoni continues to explain that this will cause, this will cause that, quote, I will transform their grief to happiness. Clearly then, the fact that the lion rose during the month of Ari and destroyed Ariel in Jerusalem is for a specific purpose, which is the reconstruction of Yerushalayim. That's the purpose of it. So the exile, the of the first exile, the Babylonian exile, came about that Jerusalem should be rebuilt as a result of it. Again, not to say that we look forward to the exile and the destruction, but a tremendous good came about from it. Jews must create the appropriate means to elicit and bring forth more swiftly the fulfillment of the promise that the lion should come during the Mazel of Ari and reconstruct Ariel. We should do something about it. And the Rebbe believed very much all the time that it's our job not just to sit back and wait and wait for the time to happen for Mashiach to come, but we have the ability to hasten the coming of Mashiach, to help bring Mashiach as never before. We have that ability. Uh, you know, in Chabad, there's a bit of a controversy over some members of the Chabad community who we call Mashiachists. And these are the people who, you know, they believe that the Rebbe was Mashiach and, and uh, all this type of stuff. And while the majority of the Chabad community really doesn't agree or doesn't take a stand with that, in any case, we don't know who the Mashiach is going to be. Maybe he will be, maybe the Rebbe, maybe he won't be the Rebbe. And some of these people are quite radical in their ways of doing things and saying things. It can be a little nutty uh, sometimes. You see all the, pic the pictures, Yechi HaMelech, and all these types of things. But people ask me all the time, what is my feeling about these people? Am I a Mashiachist? Well, the truth is, every Jew should be a Mashiachist. Every Jew should hope and pray the coming of Mashiach should happen right away. As the Rambam points out in his 13 Principles of Faith, that every single day we should hope and pray for Mashiach to come. Afalpi shehis rameya, even though he shall take his time, afalpi came animamim. I believe. I believe with perfect faith. Animamim be'amuna shalema. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of Mashiach to Keno b'mhera b'yameri should happen in our day. And every single Jew should do that. So what have these silly, crazy Mashiachists have done? I think what they've done is, even though maybe I'm not part of that group, but I think what they've done is awaken or reawaken within the Jewish people the anticipation of Mashiach, the hope for Mashiach, which I think in many cases has, has, has gone down. I think that today, you know, you mention Mashiach, and people think, oh, that's a, it, that's a Christian term. Or that's something that some a couple of crazy Chabadniks talk about. No, that's terrible. Mashiach is a Jewish concept. And it is a basic fundamental belief of every single Jew to believe in the coming of Mashiach. And unfortunately, over the years, <coughs> this idea has gone downhill. And we have lost that faith in the coming of Mashiach, unfortunately, during the ages. And I think this group, one thing they've done, at least you have to admit, is reawaken this concept and this belief in the coming of Mashiach. So, the, the, the Jewish people, the Rebbe says, must create an appropriate vessel, a means to elicit and bring forth swiftly the fulfillment of the prof promise that, that Mashiach will come. And the Torah has given us that promise. The prophets and others have talked about this promise. The Mashiach will come, and will come soon. 
The appropriate means are defined in the prophecy of Yeshayahu, the prophet, the prophet of redemption, where the, if you take a look in chapters 10 and 11 and part of 12 of Yeshayahu, it talks about the lion will lay down with the lamb, Zion b'mishpat tepada, b'shavah b'tzedakah, Zion will be redeemed through judgment, and those who return with her, the captives, through tzedakah, through charity, etc. And there are many, many uh, references to Mashiach, clear references to Mashiach, in the book of Isaiah. Ironically, many of the uh, references that our Christian neighbors point out to especially in Isaiah 53, are not uh, references to Mashiach at all, but they're references to the Jewish people. Our main references are in the earlier chapters of Isaiah, as I said, in chapters 10, 10 and 11. Uh, the Alter Rebbe, the founder of the Chabad movement, explains that Mishpat, which says, Sion b'mishpat tepada, Zion will be redeemed through judgment. Judgment, Mishpat, means Torah in general, and its laws which bring justice to the world. And tzedakah, mishaveh but tzedakah, and it's our captives through charity, means charity, means through the giving of charity. In other words, through increasing our study of Torah, which will bring us to an understanding of being able to, to observe the Torah and its mitzvahs and to understand what they're all about and how to observe them, and through giving of charity properly performed every day, putting some money in the pushka, in the charity box, and to help others in need, we will, we must, they, these have to be joined, these two, Torah and Tzedakah, need to be joined to tefillah, to prayer. And as we say, with three things was the world, says the world stand, al Torah, on Torah study, v'al avoda, on, on prayer, v'al gemilus chasadim, and on act of loving kindness. Um, which is the latter, whereby a Jew's service, his Torah and his charity, ascend to heaven through prayer. Through prayer. So these are the essential things. By increasing these three elements, we can help bring Mashiach. Now we are told that Mashiach is supposed to come during the month of Av, during on, on Tisha B'Av. It's an ideal time for Mashiach to come. How? Do, what do we do? What should we be doing today on Tisha B'Av? So. Many people, of course, we're fasting, we're sad, we're crying, all these things. But is this really the way to bring Mashiach? Is the way to bring Mashiach through crying and being sad and miserable and even fasting? Is this how we bring Mashiach? Definitely not. The Rebbe points out that, that Tisha B'Av has to be a day of doing, a day of action, where we increase our Torah study. Now, there are many aspects of Torah we're not allowed to learn on Tisha B'Av. But there are many things that we can. We can, we can study many of the prophecies dealing with, with Yirmiyahu. We can, uh, we can learn halachas dealing with mourning and avelos. We can learn uh, aspects of the prophet Yechezkel, who talks about also the coming of Mashiach and things like that. There are many things in Torah, including what we're doing right now, that can be, we can study the sechas of the Rebbe, that talk about Tisha B'Av as well. There are many things in Torah that we can learn. So rather than say, oh, we can't study Torah today, we can study, we should study Torah today. We should increase our acts of charity today. Today is a very auspicious day to give tzedakah and to make pledges to give tzedakah. If we, are, if we make a pledge to give, it's as if we gave. So it's a wonderful time to increase our giving of charity and prayer as well. Through davening, through increasing our prayer, we can also help to bring Mashiach as well. And there are many ways we can do that as well, through uh, through all the various keynotes that we re read during the daytime. We read keynotes for hours upon hours. These are the special poems and prayers that were written by the great sages to commemorate the destruction of the temple. We spend hours in the morning uh, saying keynotes. The Rebbe says our present exile has continued for a long time. No question about it. I mentioned uh, last night at Echa that Rabbi Akiva stood on uh, Mount Scopus 2,000 years ago and was very hopeful that Mashiach would come very soon. He saw the, the um, Temple Mount being plowed over 
And he, he was very optimistic as a good sign. What would Rabbi Akiva have thought, knowing that it's going to take another 2,000 years, Rabbi Akiva, for it to happen? Another 2,000 years. Would he have been completely despondent? Would he have given up hope? Unlikely. So let's talk about that. So the fact is that our present exile has lasted very, very long time. The first exile, the, the exile in Egypt was a couple of hundred years. Babylon, only 70 years. Our exile, 2,000 years and counting. But in light of the above explanation, the reason for it is clear. The exile has a purpose. There is a purpose to the exile. And the purpose of the exile is, as the words of the Torah say, to accumulate great wealth. As we are told earlier that the Jewish people would leave exile with great wealth. Well, the exile, every exile is to accumulate great wealth. What does it mean, great wealth? Does it mean physical wealth? Well, sometimes yes. The Jewish people are a, a, a well, a well uh, connected people, obviously, in many cases. We've never lived better than we are today. Certainly, we have nice homes, we drive nice cars, we eat good food. Uh, I don't think ever in our history did, we, did so many Jewish people live as well as we're living today. But it doesn't really so much talk about great wealth physically, but rather higher spiritual wealth. And this is something that the exile requires us to do, to accumulate and to attain higher spiritual levels as never before. We leave the exile, therefore, when that goal has been reached. When we have achieved what we're supposed to achieve, when we, are, when we have achieved the higher levels of spirituality, then Mashiach will come. And what does that mean? That means that in previous times, while many great sages and rabbis predicted when Mashiach would come, and the times came and went, and Mashiach did not come then. Why did they do that? Because they believed that these higher spiritual attainments were going to be reached then. And therefore, it would be all ready for the coming of Mashiach. When Mashiach did not come, meant that these, attain these attainments, these achievements, were unfortunately not met yet. Uh, and it's too bad. There's a saying that during the um, early 1800s, when, during the famous disagreements, battles, if you will, between the Hasidim and the Misnagdim, the opponents of the Hasidic movement, the Alter Rebbe, the, the Rabbi Shneur Zalman of Liadi, felt that if he, as one of the leaders of the Hasidic movement, would meet with the great Vilna Gaon, who was the leader of the opponents of the Hasidic movement, if he would meet with him, and explain to him that Hasidus is not a, a, a heretical movement, it's not a dangerous movement, but rather it is a good movement, a positive movement, and a very Jewish movement, he certainly could explain that. Then the Vilna Gaon would not have the opposition that he had throughout his entire life. In fact, the Vilna Gaon died without uh, taking back the a decree of excommunication, which he, he made on the Hasidim to his dying day. He never took it back. The Alter Rebbe felt, if I could only sit down with the man one-on-one, -on -one, these are two great, great rabbis, I could explain it to him. And I would cause his opposition to completely go away. So the Alter Rebbe, together with one of the other luminaries of the Hasidic movement, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Haradaker, went and they sat by the by the Vilna Gaon's door for a long time. I don't know if it was days or if it was even a week or two. And the Gaon refused to see them, tragically. Why did he refuse to see them? Because he had, he had um, witnesses that came to him and told him that the Hasidim were dangerous and a threat to Jewish life. And according to Halacha, if two credible witnesses come to see you, you have to listen to them. And that's what he did. So the Hasidim have no malice towards the Vilna Gaon, but rather they feel the Vilna Gaon was, did not understand the true significance, and the witnesses that came to him really did not really tell him the whole truth. And the Alter Rebbe and the Hasidim believed 
that if he met with the Alter Rebbe for certainly, he probably would not have had the opposition that he had. Who knows? Maybe he would have became a chassid himself. I don't know. But he never did that. He never did that. They believed that if the two men got together, for sure Mashiach would come. Mashiach was right around the corner. And there was such intense energy, Jewish energy, godly energy from all sides during that time, that if these two would have come together, I'm sure Mashiach would have come. And the Hasidim believed that. So the Hasidim did not take, talk uh, irreverently about the Vilna Gaon, quite the contrary. But the fact is that this was one of the predictions that they feel Mashiach could have come. So we find that the, um, the Golis, the exile, it comes about because we have not yet accomplished our spiritual goals that we need to accomplish. And we need to do that. The Talmud states that all of the reckoning, all of the reckoned dates for Mashiach's coming have passed. They've all passed. Uh, this is a quote from the Gemara and Sanhedrin, um, page 97b, that all of the dates for the coming of Mashiach have already passed, implying that various authorities in the times of the Talmud actually calculated the different dates for Mashiach to come. Similarly, many Torah greats in all generations have given dates for the redemption. Now we know that many of the rabbis today say, well, in, in the past they said, you're not allowed to calculate when Mashiach is coming. You're not supposed to tell, say, what date Mashiach is going to come. We're not allowed to do that. But many of them did it. In fact, the Rambam, Maimonides himself, the Alter Rebbe, the founder of the Chabad movement, and the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, all predicted when Mashiach would come. They've done that. And Mashiach didn't come. Mashiach did not come. Um, and the question is why. The reckoned dates that they've come up with imply that the end of the exile will come then and no other time. In other words, that's when it's going to happen, not at any other time. More than one date, though, seems to be a contradiction in terms. If it's going to happen, if it's supposed to happen then, why is it going to happen now? If it's going to happen in this year, why is it going to happen in that year? And if so many rabbis gave many different predictions of when Mashiach should come, then what's going on? It seems that it's a contradiction. But based on our previous explanation of the length of the exile, we can understand this contradiction now. Because in each time, Mashiach was supposed to come then. Mashiach was ready to come then. It's just that we weren't ready for Mashiach. We did not prepare ourselves properly for Mashiach to come. We didn't accomplish what we needed to accomplish. So, what's the criteria for the redemption? We have said that when the Jewish people have reached their spiritual level, loftier than before, and they've achieved these, this great wealth, so to speak, how much wealth must be accomplished, how high a level should be reached, before the exile is redeemed, ended, and its purpose fulfilled. How much? What's, that's the question. So it's precisely to this question that different authorities address themselves and explains the different dates given for Mashiach to come, based on, of course, what we have to accomplish. In other words, Jewish people, through their service in exile, must, can and must achieve those great heights. That is Dafka during exile that we need to accomplish what we need to accomplish. Uh, a particular sage, based on knowledge of Torah, is of the opinion that Jews can reach this, these levels. And certainly the Rebbe believed that also. The Rebbe believed that through hard work, through study of Torah, through doing a mitzvah, through helping other people, we can achieve the level that is necessary for the coming of Mashiach. And the Rebbe firmly believed in all his heart that this is going to happen. Uh, later authorities conclude that Jewish people 
are capable of attaining even higher levels than before. Is that to say that we are on a higher spiritual level than the Jews were when they received the Torah at Sinai? Or that Jews were during the Middle Ages when there was so much Torah, great Torah, uh, chidushim, great ideas of Torah were, were, were given, were resolved? Is that something that uh, we should say? Is our generation a higher generation than previous generations? And the answer is yes. Yes, we are. We are considered, as, the, uh, as uh, many rabbis have said, we are midgets indeed. We are midgets compared to generations that came before us. But when a midget stands on the shoulders of a giant, he is even higher than the giant. And therefore, we are even of a higher level than even giants who came before us. Unlike the Jews who accepted the Torah at Mount Sinai, who were the level of tzaddikim, of pure righteous people, we are the level of Bali Tshuva. We are the level of those who have done Teshuva, have done repentance. And we are told, in a place that Bal Tshuva stand, Afilu Tzadikim Gemurim, even great sages and great tzaddik and great righteous people, they are not able to stand there. That we are the generation of the Mashiach. We are the generation of the Baal Tshuvas. The, Rebbe, the, the Alter Rebbe wrote a famous book called Tanya. And Ta one of the names, Tanya has many different names. One of the names of Tanya is Sefer Shel Benoni. The book of the intermediate man. What does that mean, the intermediate man? So we know there are three people, three types of people. There are tzaddikim, righteous people. There are rishayim, wicked people. And there are benanim, who are intermediate people, people of the middle. Well, there is a book called Sefer Shel Tzaddikim, the book of the righteous. And it tells righteous people, if you're a tzaddik, exactly how to act, what to do, what tasks to observe, what holidays to observe that are uniquely yours. For Rashaim, for wicked people, I don't know if they need any books, they know what to do already. You know, wicked people are wicked, what can you say? But most of us, the vast majority of us, are neither righteous nor are we wicked. We are someplace in the middle. We are what they call benanim. We are the intermediate people. And, and we are really the, the, the nation of Benanim. All of us today, or most of us, are the level of the Benanim. And this is, what, this is who the Alter Rebbe talks to. And this is indeed the uniqueness of our generation. That the Benanim should nevertheless be righteous, be, be, be holy. In Hasidic philosophy, we are told that a tzaddik has completely conquered his Yetzirah, his evil inclination gives him no trouble at all. He is completely guided by his good inclination. The wicked are completely guided by their evil inclination. Their good inclination does not give them a hard time at all. They are completely guided by the evil inside of them. But the Benini is guided by both. He has a strong evil inclination and a strong good inclination. Does that sound familiar to you? That's all of us. But what? But we are told the Benini always conquers his evil inclination. He's still fighting. There's a war, Tanya explains a war over the, over the city, the small city, which is the body, fighting like the Dickens. But he always wins. The Benini always wins. The Benini always does the mitzvahs. Question comes up, how can you tell the difference, therefore, between a tzaddik and a benini? Some say, you really can't. Others say, by the fact that he's struggling, you can. You can see in him his struggle. But nevertheless, we are a generation primarily of benanim who struggle with fighting our evil inclination, working very hard at it. But by and large, today we win. There has never, and I mentioned this last night also, there's never been a time in history where so much Torah is being learned and taught throughout the world, especially in the land of Israel. There's so many yeshivas, so many people who are learning Torah of all ages as never before. 
Never in the history of the world have so many Jews lived in Israel as today. Some six million Jews live in Israel today, more than by far more than any other Jews in history have ever lived in Israel. How many Jews are doing good deeds? More than ever. Certainly, if you take a look at, at um, charitable organizations, at the good that is being done in the world today, and you take a look at the names there, invariably Jewish people have a very, very high level of accomplishment, of accomplishing and doing good in the world. So many Nobel Prizes in the sciences and the humanities have been awarded to Jews far beyond our nature, far beyond our numbers, rather. There are only 13 to 15 million Jews in the entire world. How do you explain it? Jewish people are committed to tikkun olam, to making the world better, to improving the world, and to acts of charity as never before in our history. So many of the doctors that are working today on, on combating this terrible virus that we're finding ourselves in are the forefront, are Jewish people. In fact, in Israel today, there are leading scientists and laboratories that are working hard day and night on making a virus, I would, uh, making a vaccine. And I would not be surprised if Israel would be the first country in the world that would come out with a viable vaccine to uh, solve this problem, no question about it. So the Rebbe points out, the Rebbe points out that the purpose is the purpose of exile is to um, to be better and to improve. So the name of this month, the name of this month is of course of, and of means father. The the um, the Hebrew months was primarily given. By Babylonian, by Babylonian names. Most of them are not Jewish names. But we have come upon that these Babylonian names have Jewish significance. And the name of refers to Father, which means God. That during this month, God should help us and God should take us out of the exile. And the name of was the name of the month for many, many years, many centuries. But then we added on a name to the, to the word of, the name Menachem. The name Menachem is an interesting name. Uh, Menachem means to comfort. Menachem means to comfort. Nachem Avelu means to comfort the mourners. So therefore, the name of the month is called Menachem. In fact, one of the names for Mashiach is Menachem. The Rebbe's name was Menachem, by the way, too. Menachem Mendel. So, we find that the name of, so what is the name of the month? Is the name of, or is it Menachem of? What does the word Menachem of mean? It can have two meanings. Menachem of can mean comfort God, that we believe that God is also in exile. God goes in exile with the Jewish people. And God is, God, is in a sense, mourns with the Jewish people for the exile and for the sadness and the destruction and, and the pain. So Menachem of comforts God. Or another way we could look at it, look at is uh, that that the Jewish people comfort God. Menachem of we comfort the Father. Not that the Father that 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 uh, God comforts us, but God, but we comfort God during this time. By the way, it's significant that uh, the word Menachem is important. It's not just a name that was added. It's significant, for example, if you write a ketubah, a marriage document, or a get, a, a, a marriage divorce document, God forbid, and you put the name Menachem of on it, it's kosher, according to halacha. If you put even the name of, of course it's kosher. If you put just the name Menachem, according to many opinions, it's also kosher. So the name Menachem itself could be a proper and is a proper name for this month. So the idea of comfort is a very important important concept during this month. The Shabbos after Tisha B'Av is called the Shabbos of Consolation. Shabbos Nachamu, after the prophecy of comfort, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, God says, I will surely comfort my people. That the Jewish people 
comfort God. How do we comfort God? We say that by, by doing mitzvahs, by doing good deeds and acting properly, we will comfort God, we will make God feel better that, um, that he should feel that we are, we are indeed deserving of, of, of redemption. And similarly, God comforts us uh, through Nachim with Achim Ami, that God says, I will comfort you through the hope and prayer that uh, the Mashiach is on his way, that, that we believe very much that it will happen. It certainly will happen. Woe, as it says, woe to the father that he exiled his sons, and woe to the sons who were exiled from their father's table. He said in a similar vein, the Sifri adds, states, Beloved is Israel, for although they are impure, we don't have a paradum anymore, we don't have red heifer anymore, we're all at the level of spiritual impurity, the divine presence is still among us. In fact, one of the images of the, um, the uh, snap, the burning bush that Moshe came in contact with, is God spoke for the bush, and the bush was not consumed. It was not burnt up. And the rabbis asked, what is the significance of that imagery? And one of the images is that while the Jewish people will be burnt, representing the bush, God will always be with us. God will speak from the burning. God will speak from the exile and from the suffering. God will always be with us during that time. Moshe answered, I don't want to tell them that because bad enough is this exile. They don't need to know that there's going to be any more exiles after that. But God accom accompanies us through all of our exiles, through all of our sufferings, and through all of our pain. God is always with us, no matter what. There is a verse in Tehillim, which is one of my favorite verses in the Psalms, which says, Hashem Yisadenu al Eres Devoy, that God comforts us on a mattress of sadness, that when we are sad and despondent, and suffering and in pain. God is always there to comfort us no matter what. And we are told there's a, there is a, um, a custom, a Jewish custom, not to sit on a, a sick person's bed. Many people don't know about this. It's a custom, a Jewish custom, not to sit on a sick person's bed. Why? Because the angels are above the bed. In fact, the angels of God are surrounding the bed, above, below, and on both sides. And the angel, Rafael, Gabriel, Michal, they are all there. And by sitting on a bed while the angel is busy healing that person, it's an affront to the angel. The angel says, move over a little bit. I've got work to do here. I'm here to help that person. I'm here to, to, um, to heal that person. And therefore, God accompanies us. God sends his holy angels to us to heal us, to feel better with us. And we're told indeed that the doctors don't do the healing. God does the healing. The angels that he sends to, does do the healing. That is really who does the healing. Now, all Jews, the Rebbe says, can feel the sorrow of exile. I'm sorry, not all Jews can feel it. For many Jews, they're having a perfectly wonderful time. They're having a great time over here in beautiful San Diego. Go to the beach, enjoy good food, have a nice time, lovely weather. And uh, the fact is, though, that uh, it's primarily a spiritual, a spiritual feeling that we need to feel. The divine presence is exiled. He's bowed down by the weight of the physical exile with its miseries and problems. So how do, we comp how do they comf com 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 comfort the Father? How do Jews who don't feel the burden of the exile, how do they comfort God? Every Jew is a son of God. Everyone. We're called B'nai Israel. We're not called grandchildren or great-grandchildren of Israel, of God. We are called B'nai Israel, the children of Israel. We're all children of God. Chosen from among other peoples. And the reason God chose us does not refer necessarily to the soul, but it refers to the body. After all, angels are spiritual beings, just like souls are. The uniqueness of us today here is our body, that the spiritual soul comes into the body. And our job is to purify the body, to make the body into a vessel for holiness. 
The soul is doing just fine. The soul is pure godliness, and uh, the soul is called is called a por portion of God from above. Chelik elokam imal mamash, a portion of God from above, actually. But what about the body? So the body, we're told, is not essentially a holy thing. It's klipa. It's a, a, an aspect of evil. And if we don't use it for holiness, that's exactly where it stays. It has no holiness. It has no purpose by itself, only in terms of what it does. So along comes a Jew who may not be at all religious, who doesn't feel any type of spirituality, any type of godliness. But he knows one thing. He's got to help other people. He's got to find cures to diseases. He's got to go out there and feed the poor and feed the hungry. He's got to do so many things. That's the idea of this tikkun olam that people are talking about all the time. To make the world into a better place. So this Jew who thinks erroneously that he's not religious is more religious than any of us. Because that Jew is accomplishing mitzvahs between man and man as no one else is. And I say that, indeed, we Orthodox Jews have much to learn from Jews who are not religious. Maybe the Jews who are not religious don't keep Shabbos, don't put on tefillin every day, but they do tremendous work in the aspects of tikkun olam, of making the world into holy, to a holy place, into a better place. And that, indeed, is what God wants from us. God wants to see that we are, indeed, making the world into a better place. <clears throat> and indeed, that's something that we need to accomplish. Um, I think that in many cases, this is something that Orthodox Jews lack, the, the laws between man and man. And indeed, non-religious Jews lack the laws between man and God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all got together? If the so-called non-religious Jews would come along and say, you know what, teach me how to put on tefillin. Show me how to keep Shabbos. Show me how to eat kosher food, <clears throat> how to pray, how to daven. Show me how a Jew acts and lives with tzitzis on, with a yarmulke on his head. I want to find out about these things. And the religious Jew, the Orthodox Jew, would say to the non-religious Jew, the chilonim, hey, teach me how you are so remarkably kind to other people, how you reach out and help other people. Show me how you can do that. I remember many years ago, I was a yeshiva student in Israel. And on Friday, I got a call, or I, I was notified, that there was a person who was very ill <clears throat> in the hospital. He was ill in the hospital. And if I would come and visit him on Shabbos, he would very much like me to come and visit him on Shabbos. Well, the hospital was very far away from my yeshiva. It was about a two or three hour walk from my yeshiva to go to this hospital. He was a Hadassah or something like that. So I asked my roommate if he were to come with me. Walk with me, let's walk to the hospital on Shabbos. We'll daven, we'll, we'll, we'll eat our Shabbos meal, and then we'll, off we'll go for the rest of the day to the hospital, we'll visit the sick person. And my roommate said, no, I can't do it. Why? Because I have a, a class that I go to on Shabbos afternoon, and it's very important to me that I attend this Torah class Shabbos afternoon. And I just don't like to miss it. I just don't want to go there. And I thought to myself, how sad, that here there's a Jew in a hospital who is ill, who's not well, that we can go there and we can make him better. We're told that a person who goes to visit someone who's sick takes away one sixtieth of his illness. It's true. You make the person feel better. You help them get better. That happens. And to forsake that is such a sad thing. We have a lot to learn from people in the so-called non-Orthodox world to make this world into a better world. And indeed, I think that all of our actions, when we act properly in both aspects, mitzvahs between man and man, mitzvahs between man and God, and when we finally get to that point that we are all on the same page and we're all working on it, then that is when Mashiach will come. Everyone have an easy fast. Oh, beautiful.